And we're live. It is Thursday, December 2nd, 5.01 p.m. Eastern Time. I have 35 unread emails from people with the he- with the subject line hurts in my email inbox. Everyone has been sending me their stories of how Hertz has screwed them over from all over the country and or just like asking for my help in various ways. <laughs> I feel completely overwhelmed. I'm just archiving them. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I don't really want to become like some type of spokesperson for um, standing up to car rental companies or consumer protection at all. That's like not even the type of lawyer I am. I'm not even a lawyer. I'm the type of lawyer that doesn't have to be a lawyer. <laughs> like I just, yeah. So anyways, but we're here with probably one of the best lawyers that I know, Jeff Kosef, to talk about one of his books. He writes, he has written two, meant two, more than two. Have you written something? If you count a textbook, it's three, but. Three, three books. Count one, the textbook. <laughs> and Anyway, so we're not allowed to have anymore, but we are allowed to have Jeff Gosef talking about his new book, The United States of Anonymous. If it is anything like his last book, which was in the section 230, called The 26 Words That Invented the Internet, it will probably provoke some type of executive order that will then cause it to be in such high demand that it is sold out and the university press has to suddenly go into a second printing, which university presses are like not accustomed to ever doing. <laughs> and, uh, so I would buy it now, folks. I'm putting a link in the chat. Uh, I have uh, a copy of it on my computer um, and a copy of it in my office. And I'm put, buying another copy right now. The copy that I have in my office is printed off from the or copy that you gave me. Um, but yeah, which is, I hope I'm not violating copyright or something. But anyways, Jeff. Not Thanks a for not enforcing lawyer. copyright against me. Uh, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Good. How are you? Good. Um, so are you in Annapolis? You were coming on. Uh, I am in Arlington right now. Mm. I have a oh, wait. You have to say your disclaimer, Jeff. Yes. My disclaimer is that everything I say is only on my behalf. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Naval Academy, the Department of Navy, or the Department of Defense. Nobody um, wants to take credit for what I say. Even me, my family doesn't want to. So just me. <laughs> so when you say that, I'm, I'm just curious for your um, uh, own internal emotional response when you say that. When you say that, do you feel a, fr- a sense of freedom because now I can say anything and there's no accountability? Uh, uh, or do you feel like it's a, uh, a bit of... Uh, um boilerplate that you have to get off your chest before you can say anything else or do you uh, do you have some other reaction to having to say that i mean i can't say anything um just i mean there are social consequences uh possibly legal consequences of saying anything outside of the government employment aspect but it does um allow me to speak so people don't think i'm representing official military policy which is a good thing but like, um, why would people ever think that? Like, because he works well, for the military. I mean, so some some of the work he works that for I the involved, Naval Academy. Like, they don't set military policy. That's true, but some of the work. Although there it, there was one time that someone put my name because I'm in the cyber science department at the Naval Academy. Somehow my name got on some mark B two B marketers list as being responsible for all the cybersecurity purchases for the U.S. Navy. And my and it was my cell phone, and I got so many calls, and it went on for like more than a month. So, someone did think that I was representing the Navy, which would have been a really bad thing. I should not be in charge of purchasing anything for the Navy. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the United States of Anonymous. Uh, it is a book that's kind of delves into um, anonymity in the United States, as it would suggest, but also the ideas of how the First Amendment in particular protects anonymity. But I'm imagining it goes beyond First Amendment. So do you want to kind of give us like a little bit of like the boilerplate idea around anonymity and like what you're trying to uncover with the book? Yeah. So this actually is an outgrowth of my Section 230 book, because one of the 
big defenses of Section 230 when people say, you know, this I want you to know we have a drinking game every time someone mentions norms or Section 230, people have to drink in the chat, mm -hmm. yell drink and then chat. So please keep that in mind whenever you say Section 230. Section okay. 230 is a trigger word for drinking, Section 230. Okay, so uh, what I would say is um, the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act is what I wrote. <laughs> and, um, so, so what the old about, Exxon Amendment. Yes, yes. The, so people who, the Cox Wyden Amendment, people who defend the Cox Wyden Amendment say you can't, it, that it basically says you can't sue the platform, but you can sue the poster. And before I joined the Naval Academy, I practiced media law and I represented websites that had user comments and we would sometimes get subpoenas for identifying information, including IP addresses of anonymous posters who usually posted things that were not anywhere near defamatory, but some company or government official wants to basically shame them. So they try to they file a bogus defamation lawsuit. And I knew that uh, the standard that, that we or the poster could go to court and challenge the subpoena. And the standard under the First Amendment has been set, and it varies by court, fairly high. And so that's not always the case. You can't, you, you can sue the poster, but they're usually a John Doe. Um, and there's a fairly strong, but not absolute First Amendment protection. And then in, on top of that, there are sort of operational and technical barriers. So you, someone could be using Tor, or they could be um, posting from a coffee shop. And, I mean, there's a lot of ways to still be anonymous. And I wanted to look more into that. And I was really intrigued, and I've all been intrigued since I was practicing, about why the courts interpreted the First Amendment for these online poster subpoenas in this way. Um, so that took me back to the uh, Federalist Papers, actually before that, the Letters of Junius, and uh, all of these sort of fundamental documents uh, for, for the United States and really, really preceding that in England. And um, those really helped shape the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on anonymous speech and anonymous associations. So I basically started there and traced it as to how did these principles become operationalized legally. And um, so what was the first, like, so just not to kind of, but I'm really, I actually kind of, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I teach property law. We obviously, when we do property, we go back. I mean, also property law, most of the US law traces back to England because spoiler mm -hmm. alert, we're all, we're like, most of us were from there when, when it started. And that was kind of when the United States started. And so that was where we borrowed our law from. Um, so I teach like, you know, Lord Black, like Blackstone and like kind of everything else. But like, where does anonymity come from? In well, in England, England, they definitely didn't have it. Um, they, yeah. they, there was like Junius was anonymous because, and people think Junius was a he. There's fairly, not absolute certainty, but there's um, some, some belief of who it was. But uh, Junius at the time was able to maintain his anonymity by um, really setting these intricate drop-off points for the editor of the newspaper. So, and he had people rewrite the letters in their own hands so it couldn't be traced back to him. Uh, but the editor of the newspaper was uh, prosecuted and uh, there was actually a brave jury that uh, refused to uh, convict. But uh, in England, there really wasn't, there was no legal barrier. It really actually, and in the United States at first, there, really, there wasn't either. It um, really emerged in, the civil rights era and in the uh, sort of post Brown versus Board of Education uh, deep south, uh, the, the first case where the Supreme Court ever recognized a right to anonymity was a case where uh, right after Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the state of Alabama, not surprisingly, the official, the governor and the attorney general really wanted to go after the NAACP because they were working on desegregation. So um, the state realized that the NAACP had not filed the proper corporation registration forms. And rather than just say, hey, file the corporation registration forms, the state sues the NAACP and seeks an injunction to shut them down. But hmm. then on top of that, as part of the discovery for this lawsuit, uh, they request the names of all of the members of the NAACP's Alabama chapter, which in 1956 is not there, there are very good reasons to 
not provide and publicize the names of all of the members. There's a lot of fear of uh, retaliation. And so uh, it goes to a judge, a local state court judge, who actually is the same judge who um, was the trial court judge in New York Times for Sullivan a few years later. Oh, really? Um, it was the same yeah. one? Uh, oh, yeah, I didn't yeah, it was. And uh, he, he was a blatant racist. He had published newspaper columns saying, I speak for the white race, um, talking about white supremacy. It, it, it was really... Uh, some horrific stuff, but he gets the case and he, of course, grants the discovery order, issues an injunction to shut down the NAACP in Alabama. The Supreme Court of Alabama doesn't really do anything. They, they find some procedural loopholes. This is Clayton Hardware, right? No, this is NAACP versus Alabama. Um, okay. And, yeah. and then, so it goes to the Separate Supreme Court. Separate issue in Clayton. And, and the Supreme Court finds within the First Amendment, it's actually not speech yet. They find the, a right to anonymously associate. And um, the, it's a unanimous decision, and they, they basically find the reasoning, and they, they don't really look at much of the speech issues, but they say there's a right to anonymity, uh, and there are good reasons to remain anonymous. And they, uh, don't, they, they rule in a few other NAACP cases, one involving Little Rock that passed an ordinance requiring the NAACP to disclose its members, and the same result. Uh, but it's actually in 1960 when there is a civil rights activist in Los Angeles named Manuel Kelly, who's passing out flyers uh, outside of a market in Los Angeles that he said discriminates, uh, uh, has discriminatory hire or sells products that from companies that have discriminatory hiring practices. And he, uh, so he's handing out the flyers and he gets arrested because there's a Los Angeles ordinance that says, you must have the name of the author underneath uh, uh, on every flyer you distribute. And he challenges it in part, actually, he, his challenge is more equal protection at the trial court. And he says the same supermarket, they actually hand out flyers also, and they don't list the author. So why do I have to? And the judge said, you know, I'm not going to listen to that. Uh, you were you you were arrested. I'm going to uphold your it was just it was a fine. But he challenges it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And this is where the Supreme Court really first really thoughtfully articulates a very broad right to anonymous speech rather than just association. And they point to the Federalist Papers, the Letters of Junius, um, so many other uh, really foundational documents, common sense. And they say there is uh, th that restricting the ability to communicate anonymously is a restriction on speech because there are so many people who don't have the ability to speak with their real name. Uh, and this gets uh, reaffirmed uh, in the 1990s. Wait, 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 hold on. When you say ability, like I want to kind of, what I want to say, like, I want to like complicate that idea sure. just really quickly. Let's like, so when people have, don't have the ability to speak anonymously, it me like, what do we mean by that? Like, I think what we mean by that, and I would imagine the justices would agree with me um, based on the decisions that you're talking about is that it's about adhering your own reputation and your own name uh, to, to an idea. It's about putting your personal identity and then the information that flows from your name, like your address, your email, your like job into kind of the mix, which creates safety issues. Um, it, um, it, like, um, it makes you, I mean, so both of those things, like the reputational part, like it puts your reputation on the line, and like the, the safety element are the things that I would say, but are, is there other, are there other things that the court holds, holds on to or is, are those the primary two? Well, the, those for, for the court, those are the primary two. There are other cases where the courts, um, where, where the courts elaborate. And in, in the book, I pull out different motivations for anonymous speech. This wasn't really a Metali case, but I mean, in addition to what you uh, were talking about, I also talk about there really being a motivation for the speech itself being shaped by not having the real name of the author. So um, that the, uh, I mean, well, I, I couldn't that the, cut both ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, right. there's the the uh, but but that that's a choice that's up to the author. That the lack of so in some cases, if there's not, and there there are some courts that have set found you know if it's something anonymous on the internet we're not going to give as much weight to the possible harm that it would do because of the credibility 
of it. But at the same time, uh, there is speech that uh, because you're not identifying the name of the author, perhaps has more power to it. And this goes all the way back to the founding of the country. Um, the I, I mean, we, we had some uh, really wealthy people writing as farmers uh, and not identifying exactly who they are. Um, and, and there's also this idea- And you're muted. Doing, They're not- Sorry. Mind. The, the Federalist Papers were not anonymous because James Madison had safety concerns or because Alexander Hamilton well, feared, yeah. feared lynching. They were anonymous because there was a convention at the time that you shouldn't use your name, you shouldn't trade on your name. Mm -hmm. And so all the Federalist and Anti-Federalist Papers are written in the name of some high-minded no, they're not as as I think as Jeff is saying, like they are not. They're also written as like kind of right, Jeff. I'm trying to remember. Aren't some of them written as farmers or as like ladies? No, no, no. Oh, okay. well, like a Pennsylvania farmer, but it's like some platonic well, ideal, not I am saying as George Washington that blah blah blah. Uh, it's it's I'm saying as Publius, you know. A yeah. general member of the public, a Roman um, ruler, um, and, and I mean, I mean, Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense as an Englishman. I mean, it right. was written by an Englishman. Uh, so there, there are different motivations. I mean, I think the Federalist Papers and, to probably the same extent, Common Sense are more of the speech motivation. So it's the pseudonym or the anonym the, or the lack of any pen name at all would be something that helps that's part of the speech itself. Uh, there are a variety of different motivations. Um, I'd say the NAACP was definitely motivated more by obviously the safety and le legal ramifications. Um, but there are cases, and I have a chapter in the book later on where the courts have gone both ways on anti-mask laws. So not like the current debate, but um, many states and some local governments have laws that um, they, they, they went after various problems, but most commonly the KKK, um, to say that you can't wear a mask in public or you can't wear a mask for the purpose of disguising yourself, whatever the um, whatever the particular wording was. And the court, to, we, we have court rulings both ways in terms of whether that's acceptable speech, but one of the argument, main arguments in those cases is um, that there, there's some symbolism in the mask and that that's part of the communication of, of the speech and courts have uh, met that with different degrees of scrutiny but uh, and there's also the issue that anonymity is not really binary it's really on a sliding scale so uh, there are some people and I'm sure you see some people on Twitter who if you if you took a little time, you could figure out who they are, or they might. Devin Nunes is Cal, for example. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not exactly a big secret who she is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, there are a lot of people who, for various reasons, might want only certain people to be able to figure out who they are, but or they, they might know, yeah, someone might unmask me, and I mean, especially you with increasing frequency, people who think that they are fully anonymous or pseudonymous get unmasked. I mean, we have, um, this was about eight years ago now, there was someone called Nat Sekwonk, uh, who, who, during the Obama administration, who tweeted some pretty snarky things about the Obama administration's foreign policy people and found out it was someone who worked on foreign policy in the White House. Um, and he, I mean, he, I, I didn't talk to him for the book, but I think he probably wouldn't have wanted his name associated with that. He got fired. Um, but, but, but but this is the friction of anonymity. You said sliding scale, but I'm going to put the word friction in because sure. if there is like, because there's a friction in the knowledge, like there's a friction in like, I can Google who is Devin Nunes's cow mm -hmm. and probably find the answer fairly quickly. And then like, it's another thing to like, for example, have an address and have to go and register with my real name and like email oh, uh, yeah. to, to some counties top property records to be able to find out where that person lives. 
for example, or something like that, right? There's like all types of levels of friction yeah. to other types of identifying information. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think that especially, I mean, one, one issue that I deal with later in the book is, I mean, the fact that the that we have very little regulation. I mean, the First Amendment, is un, unlike what many members of Congress would say these days, and I'm still speaking on my own behalf, I continue to speak on my own behalf, is that the First Amendment uh, is, is applies to state action. So, I mean, the subpoenas apply because these are court issued. The, the First Amendment applies because these are court issued subpoenas. But um, to the extent that a company like Facebook wants to have a real name policy, it can do that. And it has faced criticism for that, both because it's not terribly effective at getting bad actors and also that it marginalizes uh, some communities even further. Uh, and then there's also the issue that companies maintain pretty vast databases of information about people and they're subject to being hacked. There's always that they, they sell them, the data brokers sell geolocation information, all sorts of information. So uh, the First Amendment does its job, but it's also not going to be uh, the absolute guarantor of anonymity because it, it just it has limits and so much of what we're doing now involves private action. So, yes, 100%. And I really think that that has to be underscored is like the limit. So like, I want to talk for a second about, you brought up anti-mask laws and I was going to wait till kind of the end, but we're already at 25 minutes and I feel like we might as well like kind of like start talking about it now. You, you started this, you started today kind of talking about how important anonymity by association was for groups like the NAACP. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is like the civil, this is like the civil rights background mm -hmm. in which like anonymity is kind of, the protection of anonymity by the Supreme Court is like kind of balanced. Normatively, this is consistent with the anti-mask laws that then become kind of put into effect for the Ku Klux Klan. That you cannot have, you have to go with your own face and protest in public, right? And like mm -hmm. to have like this type of like, we're not gonna let you be a terrorist behind a hood and like go and like literally like burn crosses in people's homes or like threaten their lives because you're in a white sheet. Okay, and so these are like, I mean, when I say normatively consistent, I guess I mean like they are all in the balance of like these types of things are being used for racism or to combat or to punish people who speak out against racism. And so we are trying to like push the world forward in this type of normative way, or at least have the law reflect those types of protections. Um, let's fast forward to like right now mm -hmm. um, and facial recognition software. And more than facial recognition software, let's just like fast forward to like the ability to the experiment that I had my students do that I know that we've talked about before, which is it's like, in the book. I know, but like that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my creepy experiment. So to those who I wrote a New York Times piece on this, but I had my information privacy students do the experiment. And this particular class, I talked to Jeff a lot about, cause I think it was my, it was my first information privacy class that I was teaching. And before before the um, before spring break, I had some students, and a number of them were women. They were actually, I think it was all women of color in the like uh, that kind of had this view. They really believed that a bunch of them are about to be DAs. I should mention, um, or assistant DAs, uh, and they ha they firmly believed that like if you hadn't done anything wrong, you had nothing to hide. That was like, that's like kind of a very, I don't know, that's a very common pushback about privacy. Um, and I had basically, I was trying to imbue them with this sense of like, you just really don't understand what privacy means. And like, and so I asked them over spring break, just if you're in a public place, you are not allowed to eavesdrop on anyone. You are not allowed to like, you know, uh, do anything that makes it or to record anyone. You're not supposed to like try to do anything that um, you're not allowed to basically like do anything with the information that you find. But see if you can go into a public place and based on what people are wearing, so like identifying like a school that they have on or a bag that has an emblem on it or something, 
or like and things that they openly say in public and reveal about themselves see if you can try to de-anonymize them and like using only google and your smartphone you were not like allowed to use anything else and every single person wrote to me uh in the midst of spring break so that takes a lot for law students in the midst of spring break to say like holy shit this is like blowing my mind basically like i had no idea that once i listened and paid attention like how the obscurity falls away and how thin the protections for privacy are and how actually how non-anonymous we are um and so one of the things that jeff and i talked about was that one of the things that one of my students said, she was a black gay woman um, who works in privacy now. She said to me that she thought that people should have to protest, that sh people should be allowed to protest with masks on. Because in this day and age, people can find your image and facially recognize you and then harass you online. And that that, the being in person versus being able to like find you and harass you online. The line was such that like, she thought that it was more damaging to have to not be masked than to be masked. And I thought that was, I, I mean, it was, it was a completely counterintuitive, mm -hmm. right? I mean, sorry, I like, that was a very long windup, but like Jeff, what, how did like talk about how kind of like what you thought about that in the book? Yeah, so uh, this actually gets back to the anti-mask laws, and actually, mo most of the book does involve the internet, but uh, or half of it does at least. But for the anti-mask laws, I, uh, there were two cases, uh, and you, you bring up sort of using these NAACP, NAACP precedents for the KKK, and there was a case in the late 90s in Goshen, Indiana, where they had an anti-mask ordinance. <laughs> the district judge in that case struck down the, he granted the Ku Klux Klan's request and struck down this ordinance. And he noted in his final paragraph the great irony that where the, these rights that were fought for by the NAACP and civil rights leaders are being used by the KKK. But, you know, that this is, that it's a less free society where they can't use it. Um, there's a case a few years later where it, when it came out the other way, when it went up to the Second Circuit, there were a bunch of different court rulings. Uh, but this was a case where New York had, still has an anti-mask law. Um, and this was uh, the KKK wanted to do a protest. And the NYPD at the time under Rudy Giuliani, who was actually very adamantly opposed to having the KKK in, um, in, in New York, uh, they said, no, you, you can't wear masks. You can have your rally, but you can't wear masks. And so I was able to get the paper court file from SDNY in this case, and I was looking through it, and then I saw a brief from the National Action Network, which is Al Sharpton's organization. And I, at first I thought, well, of course they're going to say they don't want the KKK to come to New York, but it was actually a brief in support of the KKK. And it said, you know, we detest everything they stand for, but if this, if New York City can restrict their free speech rights, then New York City can restrict our free speech rights. And that really hit home to me and it made It's me a true ACLU kind of moment though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I, I, but Stand I, I, on the I, principle, not on the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I and, uh, and you really see that time and again, and we're seeing right now, especially, we see some in the United States, hopefully not more, but especially in uh, the UK, we're seeing a lot of proposals for requirements to either register under your real name or operate under your real name. And uh, some of the strongest pushback from that comes from uh, the LGBT community, um, from uh, other, from mi minority groups. And uh, they say, and uh, Jillian York at EFF, she calls these sorts of proposals the white man's gambit. Because, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of luxury to be able to post under your real name. I, I mean, for me, I'm a white male tenured professor. I have certain abilities to speak under my real name that someone else doesn't have. And it would be very easy for me to say, oh yeah, let's just require everyone, let's require an ID and they have to have every comment come out under their real name. But I, I think that that comes from a very particular perspective. And also 
I don't know if it even I don't know if it addresses many of the harms um, because I, I documented a case uh, that Carrie Goldberg handled that's been much of a chapter on it where there was really a horrific case of a cyber stalker who this is the Heracle grinder case she's come no, on to talk about that no, or no no wait this is different no this is a different case this oh, was yeah. a case not involving uh, oh, right, because the, not the involving writer, the you always knew who the person was. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so th this was someone where people pretty much knew, or many people knew who it was, but he used Tor, he used VPNs, he used anonymous text messaging services, and he wreaked havoc in this woman's life and so many others. He called in more than a, a, a hundred bomb threats. I mean, there, there were, and I, I and he, he was a computer, he had majored in computer science and he was fairly sophisticated, although he did get caught. Um, but I do remember I, this. What is the, I can't remember the name of this. Anyways, I like, I, like I read this a while ago, but I like it was really stark. It was like yeah. a very sophisticated user. It was, a, I mean, it was also like, it was also hard to extrapolate from because while I will say this, like what I remembered about it was like, this is like the exact type of rule breaker who makes it hard to make rules for content moderation or for any type of like reasonable type of thing is like the idea that you give some type of let like that someone like this is the exact person that you would like that they would be able to figure out some workaround yeah. if they knew the parameters exactly but and but then sort of the average user who might have really good reasons to want to not associate their name with what they're posting online they they might not and that they, they probably might not want to circumvent the rules or they might not know how to. Um, so I, I think the impact, I, I, I don't, and I mean, you, you look at some of the platforms, we have test cases, some of the platforms that at least nominally have real name policies. Uh, some enforce them more than others, but uh, I mean, I'll give an example. I mean, Nextdoor, I, I'm on my local Nextdoor and someone uh, this morning sent out a, a picture of dog feces with a long rant and I'm thinking you know, that, that's under their real name uh, not terribly productive but I, it's not like real name policies or this magical cure that uh, lead to civility um, and I mean I, I write about it in a book in the book uh, another site that I've used uh, that's fully anonymous uh, it's used around the country but primarily in DC called DC Urban Moms and Dads where people post about a variety of issues like parenting, medical issues, finances and they it's you can't even have a pseudonym it's fully anonymous and um, there is there there is a level of candor and there's some sniping and there's a moderator who will do really bad stuff but um, but overall, people operate with a level of candor that they probably, many probably would not under their real name. So there are some real benefits. And uh, I, I look at both. I mean, I look at the case that Carrie handled and I, I see how do we address these sorts of cases uh, while without sort of compromising the values that we've had for so long about, about anonymity. All right, so I want to push back on anonymity because mm -hmm. I actually hate it. And I think that we're uh, romanticizing a very particular kind of case represented by the NAACP cases um, uh, that is not generalizable and shouldn't be generalized. Uh, and those are cases where somebody's... Uh, physical or uh, physical safety or political rights is in jeopardy. And it seems to me the normal way that we have of dealing with that is uh, on a fairly case specific basis. So as a general matter, when you go into court and sue somebody, you have to put your name on the suit. If there is a particular reason why you need to be a John Doe plaintiff, uh, you can petition a court for the ability to withhold your name as the plaintiff. Um, uh, but in these cases, we generalized a principle that strikes me as actually very particular to the circumstances. Um, and, I, you know, I think a, a working general rule that 
citizenship require is 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 a game is 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 it's not a blood sport but it's not for the faint of heart either um is is a good rule and i don't see how the the general principle of anonymity doesn't lead as conservative justices now want it to lead to all kinds of anonymous campaign spending to uh, a general culture of uh, total, um, uh, you know, uh, a total impunity for speech. And I'm not sure I understand why we should be persuaded by the fact that sometimes we need to protect the anonymity of speakers and that, you know, the state of Alabama shouldn't be able to gouge the contributors lists from the NAACP into a general principle that everybody should always be able to receive large amounts of money uh, anonymously or protect contributors lists all the time. And so my question is, haven't we confused a First Amendment principle, a, a, a kind of almost absolute First Amendment principle with, a, with what we would normally think of as a case-specific balancing test? Well, it's not an absolute. It's not even close to absolute uh, in any of the contexts. I mean, they, they use, at least in some of the Supreme Court cases, they use exacting scrutiny. And for campaign finance, even for cases like Citizens United, which... Uh, that they did uphold certain disclosure provisions as they did in previous, the McConnell case, the Buckley versus Vallejo case, uh, they, they, and there, there was some dissent. Uh, you, you talk about sort of the, what the conservative justices want to do. I think um, the late Justice Scalia would have actually very much agreed with much of what you said. His, um, his uh, dissents, primarily in the anonymous speech cases, uh, he, he found very little value in anonymous speech, but who would strongly disagree with you uh, would be Justice Thomas. Uh, Justice right. Thomas actually has written concurrences where he thinks that the Supreme Court's anonymity principles don't go far enough. And he would like to see strict scrutiny because from his point of view, he believes that as originally conceived at the time of founding, freedom of the press and speech encompassed the right to an anonymity but, because of the practice now but i'm asking for your view yeah i mean so, is, so it, I'll, I'll is, you is, is your view is your view that um that, and what does the naval academy thing sorry <laughs> yeah and, and to, what is your view on behalf of the naval academy <laughs> um like what's what's the reasonable point at which a state can say hey, if there's no particularized threat to you um, and we're really just talking about your comfort level and you want to say something um, uh, totally, you know, you know, that's going to really offend the sensibilities of the people around you, don't ask us to, to shield you from, from the criticism you're going to get. Well, so I, I don't think it, I don't think it is or should be anywhere close to absolute. And I, I think so. There are a few different principles at stake. So um, I don't think there should be a law preventing private platforms from requiring real names. I don't think anyone's really arguing that. So to the extent that Facebook or Nextdoor want to say you must use your real name, or even if they say you must provide your ID, I personally disagree with that as the default. Now, I would disagree with the law that says all platforms must uh, take ID and people must operate under their real names. I think that would be going too far. But in terms of be, I mean, primarily where this comes up legally is uh, looking at subpoenas to unmask people to so, so right. get their IP address and to get their identifying information from their ISP. It's often a two-step process depending on what the type of case it is. And that the, the courts have developed various tests that differ a little bit, um, but that's not absolute. It's a strong test. Uh, and I think that's the right balance. And there, I'll give, I'll give a, two examples. One, both, this is how the courts have come out. Uh, there have been actually a lot of cases, and this goes beyond the NAACP cases, starting in the late 90s when Yahoo Finance had bullet boards for every publicly traded company. 
people would, usually employees would post, they, they would trash talk their CEOs. Uh, they would, they, they would, and I mean, it, it, it was something that happened quite a bit and the CEOs did not like it because until that point, the public criticism that these CEOs got was usually from the press. And so it was fairly limited, but they weren't used to these lowly employees going to the public and being able to say, this is how my CEO is screwing up. And so what these companies started doing, big companies, and this was like dozens a week, would sue John Doe defendants and issue a subpoena to Yahoo. And at first Yahoo didn't even provide notice to the targets. And then they would get the IP addresses or the email addresses. And sometimes they wouldn't even need another subpoena or they would subpoena the ISP. Um, and this is where it came from. And I do think there's a big problem with that. I don't think that the court system I, should just rubber stamp these subpoenas. I also don't think it should default deny them. I think that it needs to evaluate the strength of the case, the impact on free speech rights. This is where and your we, balancing test comes in, Ben. Yeah, exactly. And that this is what the courts developed. And I'll give you a second example of a case where um, the I think where there was unmasking ordered, and I think that it was the right decision. Uh, that was the auto admit case in uh, 2007, 2008. This was a, it, I guess it still is um, because Tucker Carlson's lead writer was recently uh, unmasked for having posted on it some awful things. But this is a site directed toward law students. Uh, it attracts a fairly sociopathic group of folks who. Um, really, they identified two uh, female Yale law students, and they wrote horrific things, rape threats, lies about them, saying they had STDs. And one of them so, has been on the show. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, they, I mean, and they, they, they got, they stood up and they sued. Uh, they weren't able to sue Auto Admit because of Section Two Thirty or the Cox Widen Amendment, but. They were, they, they sued 39 John Doe posters and auto admit had this uh, policy of not logging IP addresses. So it was more challenging, but they were able to identify some of them. Uh, and, but one of them, they got the IP address and uh, the he moved to quash the subpoena to his ISP. And uh, this went to a district court judge in Connecticut. And he uh, ruled that the, he applied this prevailing test. And he said, no, this is a really strong case. Uh, I'm not going to quash the subpoena. And I think that is the right balance. I think that in cases like that, that where, I mean, there's a strong demonstration of harm uh, that I, I don't think that there, that, that there should be uh, an ability for a court to block that subpoena. On the other hand, if it's a CEO who's just pissed off because his employees don't like him, um, I don't think that the court system should be used in that way. And so what if it's a fake cow? Um, yeah. Is the so let's I mean, let's talk seriously about Devin Nunes yeah. here. Um, uh, anonymous account says mean things about Devin Nunes. Devin Nunes wants to sue the account. My instinct is the right standard there is some prima facie showing that any of the things the cow is saying are are plausibly uh, uh, defamatory. If they're not plausibly defamatory, uh, the cow has a right to move them to her heart's content uh, without being unveiled. But the moment you have a plausibly litigatable issue, uh, that would survive a motion to dismiss, he's got to be able to get discovery, right? Well, so that's not the only, only factor. There are other factors, and the tests vary a bit. Um, but I think, so So I think that's part of it. But in the, in the test that's most commonly cited, the dendrite test, which was developed in 2001 by the Appellate Division of New Jersey, um, they and th this was something I don't know if Paul Levy has ever been on your show, but if not, I would highly recommend. He's a public citizen. I would. He's uh, really, really a hero in uh, so many online speech issues. Um, but he got the court to uh, develop a test that was similar to previous ones, but had a final factor where the court balances uh, the strength of the case versus the free speech right. So it gives the court some 
ability, some flexibility. And I think that uh, if it's someone who's criticized, so, so I, and, and I think that the motion to dismiss or summary judgment standard alone, there is some trickiness, especially when you're dealing with a public official. But on top of that, the court should have the ability to balance and say, okay, well, who are they speaking about? What's the, what, 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 and what is the harm to free speech by unmasking this person? And I think that could be different um, if you're dealing with uh, a public, an elected official versus um, a law student whose life is ruined because because of this. I, and and I, I think and I do I, I do worry about giving too much unchecked discretion to judges for anything. But I also think that we do need to that there there does need to be a balance, and I think that the Dendrick test does a really good job of that. Can I can so, I say what I think the theory behind that test is basically, uh, and like what I think we're talking around here mm -hmm. is that like anonymity in the right hands can be power, um, without safe like without like, and people will feel empowered by anonymity mm -hmm. because like in places there are so many places in which like. I don't really want to go out on a line and say something and people and like I think Quinto is the one who was on the show once and said like well isn't everything self-censorship isn't everything that you say like something that you're thinking of not saying and trying to decide whether to say or not but I do think that there is a more conscious secondary order of self-censorship in which you like think about the ramifications to your personal reputation and to your the into your personal safety that like you're not going to put your reputation on the line for speaking about truth or to put truth out there in the universe. And we want truth out there in the universe. Like it is a function of democracy to have truth, like have ideas put forth into a space to have them like, whether they're anonymous or not recursively kind of, if we just let people who have no fear of like reputational reprise because they're, they're so powerful that they're beyond that, or like they're so powerful that they can't, that they can pay for safety. That that's like, you know, that, that, that those are not, that's like kind of exactly what we're trying to avoid and what anonymity gives us. To be fair, that can go both ways. It can be used to bully and harass people that are like, right? And like, it can be used to like, to speak like truth to power. The balancing test that I think the dendrite test gives is like exactly that test. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the individual like instance and saying, but like, but the, the but the first valence has to be that we allow the anonymity. The, yeah. Like the first, like the set, like it can't be a per se test. Like it can't be some type of like opposite yeah. rule, right? Like I mean, that's kind of the whole nature of it. Um, so hold, we're running out of time. Holy crap, it's 5.50 already. Um, Mike Godwin, the floor is yours. Lovely to see you as always. Hello, friend. Hi, Mike. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Hey, listen, so uh, I, I I always change my question a little bit, but I'm going to try not to because Ben hates it so much, so I'm going to try not to this time. Um, you know, uh, I w was just having this argument in uh, the chat about uh, NAACP versus Alabama and how it's cited in Griswold versus Connecticut, which of course leads to Roe versus Wade. Uh, and I think the general question that I want to ask uh, there, you know, there it seems to be that there are connections with, with these unenumerated privacy rights. It's not just First Amendment law, but also things like lawyer client privilege and doctor patient privilege. And all of these things are, uh, uh, are sort of rooted in our tradition. They're not all First Amendment arguments, but they're all kind of knitted together with First Amendment arguments. And I thought that in light of the fact that, you know, the clock is ticking on Roe versus Wade, you might want to talk about these unenumerated, unenumerated rights, privacy rights, freedom of expression, and how they're uh, connected. Yeah, I mean, I've I fully agree. I, th I think they, they are connected. And I do think I, I while, while I was really doing the research on NAACP versus Alabama, it was amazing to see how many cases relied on it for a variety of propositions uh, related to associational rights and sort of the penumbral right of privacy. Um, I do think that the right to anonymity is perhaps going to have a longer life in the Supreme Court, at least. Um, perhaps that's, I, 
that that's being too optimistic, but I do think that uncharacteristically probably, optimistic of you, Jeff. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I I also thought I was writing a book about Section 230 that would be about an obscure law that no one was ever going to care about. Um, and so so I, I'm not great at predicting, but I do think that uh, for some of the things that Ben talked about, particularly and this 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 gets pessimistic. Uh, with how anonymity does translate into campaign finance related issues, I do think there is perhaps more incentive on the conservative bloc, which is effectively becoming the Supreme Court, uh, all, all of the Supreme Court, uh, to maintain some of those rights. So I, I don't know. I, I think that, but so, so, so I, I don't think it's imminently in danger in the Supreme Court. I think Congress, on the other hand, uh, there have been some proposals that do concern me. I do think, though, that it's mischievous of Mike, uh, I, and I would say this if you, I would say you if you were still on the screen, Mike, uh, so, uh, to to link this to doctor patient confidentiality or attorney client privilege. Those doctrines have quite different roots. They're much. Uh, uh, there, uh, at least the attorney-client privilege is much older, um, and they don't—they uh, don't sound in the First Amendment. They're fiduciary responsibilities. Oh. Uh, They're uh, not based. In, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. Although I will say that Paul Levy, who basically the New Jersey court basically copied his test, they, which was a great thing for a lawyer to do, file an amicus brief, and they adopt your entire test. Uh, that balancing test actually came from a number of different sources, but primarily from reporter privilege cases. So, um, right. Yeah. But, re but the reporter privilege cases come from the first amendment. I mean, well, the notion, amendment. the notion of the, the reporter privilege comes from the first amendment, but whereas the notion of the attorney client privilege is yeah. first of all, older than the first amendment. Yeah. And secondly is, is not, doesn't sound in anonymity. It sounds in, in the nature of the fiduciary relationship of the profession. I mean, if we really wanted to get into it, and we should, maybe we should have an anonymity week, Ben. When the week that Jeff's art, the Jeff's in which we all do this, out. and we yeah. talk, we we'll just, just it's a blank voices. screen, we'll just be voices, voices, and nobody will know who we are. David Hi, Botts, you get the last question always. today. Hi, He's David. getting Alice today. I know, um, sorry, go ahead, David. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's super interesting. This question is maybe a little bit related, but given the difficulty in maintaining anonymity, isn't anonymity fundamentally really reserved for the well-funded, the technical elite, um, it, those with the resources who can afford to do it, whereas little people probably cannot? The opposite is true. Well, well it depends um, so, on what you yeah. Well, so the, let me just give you a really tangible example of this that supports Jeff's point, not mine. Um, look, I've had significant security issues over the last few years as a result of things that I've said in public, uh, up to and including people coming to my house and defacing my car. And, you know, I've had to make significant financial investments in uh, in being able to speak non, not an anonymously. And one thing that an anonymity does is it, if it's done effectively anyway, it can relieve you of the, the, ne the necessity to have means in order to participate in the debate. I agree. <laughs> I, I think, uh, and, and I mean, I think that that's really why you see so much pushback. I mean, Facebook over the, really for its, most of its existence um, has received a tremendous amount of pushback for its real name policy. And it has come from groups that face circumstances where they wouldn't be able to communicate. I, I want to say that the real name policy, though, comes from an interesting balancing. Like they were attempting to try to institute a real name balance, like a real name test. I, I mean, and Jillian will even acknowledge this, Jillian York, who's been on the show, but like she'll acknowledge this, but like the real name policy, although it's a complete bullshit and ends up kind of like having a lot of like problems, is like comes from a place of like there the world like the internet is full of dogs and no one knows that you're a dog on the internet and like that you're gonna get 
troll. Yeah, no one knows you're wearing a dog shirt on the internet. Except we made an entire show, Ben, <laughs> and we did 558 episodes, and now you've worn a dog. Everyone shirt. Like, knows that you're wearing a dog shirt. And so now everyone knows you're a dog shirt on the internet. But like, That's right. anyway, like, but seriously, that there is kind of like this. So I mean, like. I want to say that it's very interesting was like that 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 policy but this is why there are no easy policies around the internet that you and i both know is because the trade-off is that that because at scale the balancing test that like ben is speaking to is impossible like it's not a possible no. balancing test to do and so you have to come up with per se rules and you have to decide that you're going to have some bullshit real name policy that still lets certain trolls that are sophisticated get around it and that it's going to ban certain really positive voices that would be empowered by anonymity from not participating. And those are kind of like, that's, I mean, that doesn't get us any better to where we were without the policy. So like, it's just kind of, that's, you're hoping you're catching more, I don't know what the opposite of dolphins is, but like, whatever more garbage in the net than you're catching dolphins, like type of thing. Like that's basically what you're trying to do. Um, and like, I, it's not always clear that's happening. So yeah. Jeff, how do you feel about an anonymity week where we have like Jillian on to you and Jillian on to talk? We have like you on when your book comes out. Once no, but we don't out. identify any of the participants. Except so, my you know, uh, whatever, yeah. Joining us is the, the anonymous author of, uh, 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 no. no, but I feel like you think that. I feel like this would be really fun. There's lots of yeah. people who have like, I mean, we, I, I mean, I think we could have, I think some of the people who are now public about being the auto admit people would be willing to come on and reveal their anonymity and talk about also, what it meant for them. We I could think also have, really cool week. have anonymous have pugilism week um, yes. where, um, where we see whether the anonymous people are more, are more or less civil than the named people. We yeah. could have alternate days of anonymous pugilists and and named pugilists. Have you guys watched The Voice or like whatever? What was it? Have you watched those shows that like there's actually like a like a very talented singer or like talented at something singing in like some extravagant costume and like people have to like try to guess who it is? No one's seen this. Sounds awful. Like, no. But I would love to sing show. in them. Yeah, no, I'll I'll play that game. Okay. Uh, dress me up in we'll an extravagant costume gonna, and I'll we're sing. Gonna, we're going to workshop the concept and we'll get back to you. <laughs> it, yeah, I think like I'm going to Tim Gunn this or something. Um, but the, I, Jeff, I love talking to you. Like, I feel smarter every time we have a conversation or text exchange. Which is, <laughs> it is great to see your yeah. face. It's been a long time. I don't think I've yeah. seen you since we were at Stanford together. It was um, a while ago. It was a while yeah. ago. Um, you're a great American, and uh, come back soon. And you don't speak for Absolutely. the Naval Academy. We will be back. Right. Every uh, single thing Jeff said today should be attributed. Absolutely to, not. <laughs> to himself. Uh, yes. There, there we go. See? Wait. Now we can clip that and fuck it all up. Anyway, <laughs> we will be back 23 hours from now with Noah Hoffman, Formerly of the U.S. Olympic cross country ski team, current. He can be talking about anonymity. He's written a Brett. new book. It's all about doping anonymously. No, that's actually <laughs> the, not what he's done. Um, no, Noah is an outspoken critic um, of of doping in sports, and has uh, and has done a lot of activism work. Uh, about this issue and he will be here tomorrow to talk about what it's like to be a child no offense noah and be on the u.s olympic team and to then retire from your career at age 26 and go to college um and talk about doping in sports and a whole bunch of other stuff and that will be 22 23 then help 22 hours and 59, 22 minutes, hours from and 59 minutes from now. <laughs> uh, and until then, Ben? We don't have fun anymore. But thanks to anonymity, we can not have fun without... We can make it even less fun for other people 
by uh, attacking them without revealing who we are. That's dark, Ben. Why did you that? <laughs> Sorry. I, you know, it's not I'm gonna all... say that I'm going to send you a anonymous potato parcel. There's a thing that you can send people, but you don't know about this? Anonymous potato? That sounds yeah, like you a... you can mail a it sounds, potato. Anonymous <laughs> potato sounds like, you know, on Google Docs when you're editing and somebody who's not logged in uh, logs in, you get like anonymous antelope yeah. um, is making edits to your thing. This sounds like that, Kate. Yeah, anonymous potato. I'll send you both one. You can right. make... Excellent.